Hey everybody, Chris here. Just a quick heads up, this episode was recorded in November of 2018, so there may be references to some outdated things. I know we referenced the Olympics happening in 2020, obviously that didn't happen, and I know that we also mention Nate's Instagram handle, which has since been changed to at Nate Drolet, spelled Drolet. I'm sure there are others. All right, let's get into it. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton. This is Nate Rolay. I'm Paul Kersoff. And together we form Larry, Moe, and Curly. Nate, who are? The Three Stooges. All right. Nate got an old one. I got one. Jeremy Ho will be proud. (laughs) He will. He won't have to email you this time. (laughs) Jay Ho emailed me and was like, how old is Nate? He doesn't get any references. Is he like 12? I just get stumped easily sometimes. Always. <clears throat> All right. Today we are again sitting here in Rachel and Eddie's basement. Thank you guys for letting us do this. Our female counterparts are sitting across the room watching doggo language videos on Dogo. the internet. Dogo. Doggo. I don't even know what this shit is. It's crazy. You guys should be looking at powercompanyclimbing.com or <laughs> cruxconditioning.com. Those are the only websites that matter right now. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. We are here today to talk about the top six. It was originally top five. Mm -hmm. We moved it to top six. I feel like we could move it to top 27 and we could do this. We could do a whole new podcast on just training myths. Just training myths. The top six training myths. That's today's topic. And I think we had a tough time coming up with these and ordering them and i feel like we like i just said we we could have just kept going Mm -hmm. it seems like myths are pervasive and maybe we're part of that problem for putting out so much information all the time um even though i do try to filter a little bit and make sure i'm not speaking in absolutes and maybe that's the problem here. Like a lot of people love to speak in absolutes that this is the way, this is the only way. And then it somehow catches on and becomes this myth that just gets repeated over and over and over throughout time. Do you agree with that? Is that yeah. am I on the right track here? Or am I just being angry? Uh, let's <clears throat> not rule anything out here. <laughs> All right. I think it comes down to the fact that a lot of times people are looking for the magic bullet. And, you know, sometimes when people... And people want to give it to them. Yep. And when people... Training can be a difficult process at times, you know. Mm -hmm. You're not... You may not see immediate improvement. And a lot of times it's easy to see this new thing that's come out. Or especially now because we're in an interesting time. Because, you know, climbing is going to be in the Olympics in 2020. Climbing research is still very much in its infancy. Like, yeah. there's very little that's coming out in research. Yeah, like not even toddler stage. It's... Yeah, that's definitive or even tells us stuff we don't already know. Like, a right. lot of the research out right now is like, oh, hey, hangboarding's useful. Like, oh, yes. look, the coaches were right. Yeah, stuff like that. But, <clears throat> um, you know, we're in a stage where a lot of this information is coming to light and it's easy to take new information or something. You, that's been seen or someone who pr- promotes a narrative in a very aggressive or strong fashion and use it as kind of your parachute into getting out of a training method that's challenging for you, which could be causing some growth mm, yeah. into something that maybe fits what you think is helpful or just is feels easy for you to start out with and let you kind of escape a little bit of the struggle because struggle's good sometimes. Yeah, totally. That's a really good way to say this. Do you want to be co-host? Because I could just kick Nate off this thing. I don't think I could handle the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it requires a lot of drinking. <clears throat> it does require a lot of drinking. So, yeah. 
Um, well, actually, I think that sort of takes us right into our number six because you mentioned that it's sort of a parachute. It's it's almost an easy way out. Um, and I see this quite often. And number six is that you should be you should be doing corrective exercises. That's the myth that you should be doing all these correctives. And I think for a lot of people, it's, I don't want to put in hard work. I'd rather do 500 of these different really easy band exercises every day to correct all these little things I have wrong rather than do the hard work to make myself better. You know, now that I think about it, you are <clears throat> angry. That's yeah. I am what? You're angry. You're right. Yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I'll own it. <laughs> but yeah so this is our number six um and i think this one's really important and i feel like a lot of people stumble across this with you know good intentions and they feel like they're in a tough spot like they they get injured and their shoulders hurt elbows hurt fingers hurt whatever and man they want anything they don't care if it's all the mobility exercises in the world anything that they've ever read online, all the fucking band work that they can do with horrible form. And, but the thing is they do it with great intentions, but the problem is so many of these things that, uh, what a lot of people will do, let's say they do get hurt. They want to do all these correctives, but a lot of times they get stuck and they don't actually end up getting better from them because they're just doing a slew of random things that they saw on the internet or, Mm -hmm. googled um but also what we end up seeing is there's a lot of people who they're like oh well i'm getting older and i don't want to get hurt so i'm just going to do rather than getting stronger and strength is a great way of protecting yourself from getting hurt they start doing all these ridiculous super... frankly once you're older getting stronger is harder it is yeah and it it's a lot harder to get stronger the older you get but it's also the way to protect yourself. Yep. I would argue it becomes more important as you get older. It does. Absolutely. You know, muscle mass is harder to maintain. For muscle sure. Muscle mass is protective. That's why I was saying I think these bands are the easy way out for people. They mm -hmm. don't want to do the hard work. Instead, they would rather do all these band exercises that aren't challenging. Oh, I feel like that's what old people are relegated to. It's a lot just, of us are. Yeah, but, that's all I do. I just, go to the crag intending to climb, and I just do flippity floppity band. Before you know, you just girthitched a tree, and you're just you're <laughs> you're tied down to it. You're just got to do shoulder exercise. Every rot. I think there's like forty seven rotator cuff muscles. I you got to hit every one. I do uh, forty eight uh, different exercises. There's forty eight. There's forty eight. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you about this new research. Yeah. Um, but so we have everything from people who get injured and suddenly. They are paralyzed to the point to where they they don't think they can get stronger. They just need to fix the problems. And and I get it. Like and there are so many people out there ready to prey on these people mm -hmm. who are just like, Oh, I see you have a problem. I have I have the solution right over here. Just follow like you know, uh follow my snake oil. Yeah. All fear, these things. Fear mongering is a huge problem right now. Totally. It's just, you know, there are all these things that probably aren't even issues that people want to there people can make a living out of terrifying people well i mean um, people can't get better unless they're doing a power company climbing custom plan i mean but these are facts chris i know that's all i'm saying but going back to opinions <laughs> uh <laughs> bands but uh <clears throat> but the other thing yes like another thing that happens with correctives is people suddenly think that that's what they need to do is oh i need to prehab against everything in the world yeah and so rather than getting strong they're trying to prevent the onslaught of every injury known to man yep um, and i and think things like like lacrosse balls and foam rollers sort of fall into this same category while i like them and i use them i think their their usefulness is far overblown as in an easy way out. Like, I'm going to do this because I don't want to go lift heavy weights or I don't want to try really hard on my boulders. Instead, I'm just going to foam roll my lats for the next hour. At mm -hmm. Crux, you know, our foam roll warm-up is, hey, you know, take five minutes, grab a foam roller, roll what feels good to you. And after yep. that, we're going to get going. Yeah, absolutely. 
other than that, if you're spending <clears throat> 30 minutes foam rolling, you're wasting a lot of time and not a lot's changing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there a better method? Like instead of all these corrective exercises and, you know, tiny little things that everyone is trying to add into their training program. I mean, I saw a training program that, that Nate had sent to him that was, Oh God. That was literally, I don't know, 50 or 60 individual little things. It was remarkable being done. And, and that's not uncommon. And it also, let's just clarify that was not training. These were all mobility, uh, band work, the things that you would do with the two pound dumbbell. Right. And not trying to throw anyone under the bus here. I think it's pretty common to see that because so many people are telling you different things. Yeah. And And the thing is this person... You want to fit it all in. Yeah. And this person was... It was like, hey, I'm getting older. I want to... Like, I love rock climbing. I want to keep rock climbing. So I want to do everything I can to be able to continue doing this without getting hurt because I am not a naturally strong person. So I feel like this is what I need to do. This is the avenue that I've been told to go down. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, it was quite literally five hours a week of shenanigans. Yep. I think it's important to either reach out and connect with someone you trust who's going to empower you and give you a few amount of paths. That was a horrible sentence. A small (laughs) amount of paths. Um, down the road. That was that, a better you, sentence. You, that's a much better <laughs> sentence. <laughs> a small amount of paths to follow that you know you'll be able to move on from that. If you're doing corrective exercise and you're doing the same movements right, right. a year down the road, <clears throat> they're not correcting anything. They're just time wasters. Yeah. You should do them for a short period of time and things should get better and you shouldn't need them anymore. Yeah. And it's important to find someone you trust or a clinician or you know a coach you trust who's going to take you through some sort of process that's going to let you zero in on what that is. I'm partial to the functional movement screen. I like it. That doesn't mean it's the only way. There's never one way. We'll get into that later. But um, someone who has a process to like really zero da- zero in on what you need to focus on as opposed to the shotgun approach, we're just going to do everything and just we're just going to do that. Um, time's important. And it's important to really look at look at the things that you need to focus on, and that's going to be different for everybody. Yeah, I'm glad you said what you just did because, you know, even though I'm not a fan of all these tiny little corrective exercises, there are times when they're really important. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not just completely useless. When I was rehabbing from shoulder surgery, initially I couldn't lift any weight. I couldn't do core exercises because it just hurt to have my shoulder in that hollow body position. So anything I could do to start building a little bit of resiliency in that shoulder and get it moving again was good. And that was funny little band exercises. And that, I don't know what the hell they call that thing. It might as well be a body shake bow. weight for all I know. Body bow. No, let's, yeah. just, let's go with you using a shake weight. Let's stick with that. I don't, let's pretend I didn't say anything. It might be on YouTube. You guys should go search around. <clears throat> um, so that stuff was really important for me then. But as soon as I could, I moved past that into lifting heavier weights. You know, that's kind of the whole basic concept behind strength training is progressive overload right doing the appropriate load but slowly and safely doing a little bit more to spur the body into changing and adapting and moving towards your goals right what about those little exercises like nate mentioned that i go out to the crag and girth hitch myself to a tree and i'm just there all day what about using those sort of exercises as warm-ups people are out there with these bands doing jazzercise at the crag to warm up their rotator cuffs how do you feel about something like that i think they're appropriate for a certain amount of people who may be recovering from a soldier's shoulder surgery or maybe have diagnosed mobility issues or structural issues in the shoulder i don't think that everybody should be doing them 
And I think that's where kind of the problem lies is that where everybody is starting to think they should be doing band external and internal rotations in seven different angles of their shoulder. Yep. Okay. Um, it depends on, you know, your past history. And I think those are, more, I think those tend to be a bit more post rehab, post injury side of things. And I think they can be very useful there. But a lot of the times the rotator cuff is more of a stabilizer and not a prime mover. And a lot right. of those movement, a lot of those movements train the rotator cuff to move the joint compared to, you know, where it's supposed to just contract, keep the humeral head in the socket. Well, a lot of the larger global movers should move the joint. Right. So there's a better way to be warming up the whole system. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Get ups. Turkish get ups. At the crag. At Carry the your kettlebells to the crag. Or just grab a rock. Shit. Loaded loaded carries into Turkish get ups. Supersets. <laughs> Take two ropes out to the crag. Just hold a rope in each hand. Yeah, carry my gear. <laughs> I use chains. <clears throat> Even better. <laughs> well, you just mentioned that it's not for everybody, that some people should be doing it. And that sort of leads us right into our number five training myth, and that's that there, there are these universal technique rules. Things like... You should always be climbing with straight arms. Ugh. You should always be turning your hips to the wall. Hip, get, get your hips as close to the wall as possible. You should always times. squat with your feet pointing straight forward. Right, exactly. Same thing with, with strength training as it is with climbing. There are all these technique rules that we've been told that aren't necessarily true all the time. Any others you can think of, Nate? Uh, hold on, let me reference my elaborate list (laughs) um so this is a little bit of a hot button topic for me the thing is so to say that there is a perfect technique would be to say that there is only one body type and only one type of person only one type of strengths only one type of weaknesses the thing is we are all different Mm -hmm. what is now i can tell you when i watch someone i can say oh that looks that looks good that was very smooth but can I tell you that was the most efficient way to do something for that exact person? No, I can't. No one can say that. We don't know that. But I've seen videos that have angles drawn on people. Ooh. And that's oh, important. Yeah. yeah. That means something. Oh, yeah. Arrows, lines, coach's eye, it's all. If you yeah. can draw an angle Facts. and tell me that's a 110 degree angle, <laughs> then it must be right. Um. So just to list a couple. Um. Three points of contact on the wall yeah. at all times. Nope. Get the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> that, oh, like, that you need to be mm. on, like, so these two are very close to my heart. One is that you should feel in control all the time. We, I was just talking with a guy today. Um, we, we were talking about a kind of a difficult, a somewhat difficult sport climb for, uh, uh, it's like the upper level moderates if you were a Drew Mack. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about Drew one- Mac now or Drew Mac 2012. I say Drew Mac now. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, somewhere in the moderates, soft moderates, <laughs> soft upper metal, soft upper, upper level, level moderates. moderates. <laughs> and we were talking about this move on it, and we were just saying like, okay, you just have to go, and it's like a trust fall. This move, like yeah. you just have to go yeah, yeah. blindly trust that you hope your hand will close around this next hold, and it's just like, that is not how sport climbing is supposed to feel. Right. Like you, you should feel like you're in some form of control. But what was it? The leader is, must not fall. That was like the old adage. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But it's one of those things, you know, in bouldering, it's completely fine. If you're like, Hey, I'm just going to scrap my way to the top of this. Yeah. And that's fine. As soon as you tie into a rope though, well, I need control all the time. Exactly. And so this is one of those things that, you know going into it, I'm going to feel like shit and I'm just going to go for it and I'm probably not even going to, in the back of my mind, believe it's going to happen, but I still have to go for it and it might work out. Yep. But that is, that goes completely against what good technique should be. You should feel in control. You should have this confidence that it's going to happen. Sometimes you just got to get scrappy. Yeah, I agree. And, and I do think in a strange, abstract sort of way, there is a level of control in releasing control oh yeah i think the best boulders and this is something that i struggle with so it's something i very much see in uh 
other people. There are a lot of great boulders who you watch them and you're just like, Dave Graham's a great example. He has this level of tenacity that is above anyone else. He, um, there's a he video. He searches of, for crystals all the searches time. Searches for crystals. He's really tenacious. Um, but there's a video of him doing Bridge of Ashes and it shows yeah. him projecting it over a season. It's a really wonderful video. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> but oh my God, when he, I think it's the Sen Go, but multiple goes, like, it just looks like everything is falling apart. Like mm-hmm. as he's climbing and he just like keeps his head down and keeps moving. Mm-hmm. Like even if his foot starts slipping, he just moves. Like hands start slipping, keeps co- like trucking along. Everything looks out of control, but he just keeps his head on and keeps moving. Yeah. Um, and it's awesome. And there's another video of him doing a Dures Limits in Seus. It's like an eight, uh, I think it's that, or I think it was 8C or 8C plus out there. Um, I forget exactly what route it was, but watching him gives me anxiety because I was, I'm just like, man, you, you look like you should be off on every single move, but he just can stay composed, keep moving, even though, you know, maybe a foot slips or he misses a hold initially. And these are things that you might say are technical errors, but it's like, well, you know, dude, he's one of the best rock climbers in the world and he can stay composed and climb well through this. This, I think this is a very valuable skill. Yep. Totally. Um, so those are some big ones. Uh, one that's also kind of close to my heart is, uh, the idea that you should only climb as fast as you can without, um, sacrificing precision, sacrificing precision quality. Yeah. Which nothing in life has ever been learned by staying in your comfort zone. So why on earth would you say, Hey, just climb as fast as you can comfortably. Like, cause if you make any mistakes, that's a problem. I did that for a long time. I, you know how much faster I got? Didn't. None. Yeah. Ninja turtles <laughs> over here. <laughs> yes. Not uh, even ninja turtles. Yeah. I was just no regular ninja. turtle. <laughs> but this is a thing that's been said forever. Like you should only move as fast as you can with perfect technique. And it's like, you know, typing is a good example. If you want to get faster at typing, you have to push so fast that you make errors. You understand why you make the errors. You correct that issue and then you keep going um i think climbing is the same way i think you can push it too far i don't think it's necessary to like sprint up things but if we say that we always have to be under this perfect control where everything is perfect all the time you're never growing you are stuck in this comfort zone yep and you know what's funny i was just recently watching a video of adamandra who everyone always references when we're talking about climbing fast because he does move at a crazy pace. Yeah. Um, Watching a video of him and I had this thought that I almost was like, that's blasphemy. But I think I was right that it looked like he was just being (laughs) sloppy with his feet, like just flopping his feet onto holds. But it was the same situation as you were talking about with Dave Graham. Like I'm like, he didn't place that foot precisely at all. He just slops it there and it works and he just keeps moving. And he's gone from that horrible foot placement in 0.2 seconds. And it didn't matter in the slightest compared to like the two seconds it would take for him to like watch the foot onto the hole. Right. Exactly. And it worked perfectly fine. You know, I would be like laser precision trying to put that toe on correctly. And here I am on the same move and he's clipping chains, you know, 20 feet above. Yeah. So there's something to be said for allowing yourself to be a little bit sloppy, a little bit out of control, and and moving a little faster all at the same time. Yeah. I You know, I think there's there's a skill to that. I did just call Adam Aldra sloppy on yeah. my podcast. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that Shots happened. Fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. I think any, so this topic is universal training rules or universal technique rules. Anytime someone says that this is the only way, turn the opposite direction. You should always be in this position when you're doing this. Negative, not true. Yeah. There, I mean, it's not even just like, oh, there are a few outliers. It's, yeah, you need to understand the full breadth. Like, I do believe that, uh, I do believe in the idea that you need to understand the rules before you can break them. 
So understanding that, hey, a lot of times if you twist your hip into the wall, you're going to get more extension from your arm. You're going to be able to reach further. Um, if you place your foot into the best part of the foothold, you're going to be able to weight that foothold better. There are some fundamental basics, and I think it's important to start by trying to learn these things. But once you understand them, I think you start to understand that you can break these rules. Yep. Like, And these rules are, they're not solid. Right. Is it the same way with strength training? Are there lots of rules that you've heard put out over the years that you think are? I think one of the most classic examples is, you know, deadlift always with the straight back. If yep. you look at some of the world record uh, breakers for in powerlifting for deadlifting, they use a rounded back technique. Would I tell people who are new to deadlifting to start doing that? Absolutely not. That's a problem. Um, but yeah, so, you know, again, learning the basics. And then after that, utilizing your structural anatomy and your leverages to get the best performance out of that. So another good one is um, foot position. A lot of times people are told to squat only with their feet pointed forward or with their feet just outside of hip width. And, you know, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. I know, uh, I believe he's a chiropractor, Ryan DeBell wrote an article about squats and hip anatomy. I think it's on the movement fix is his blog, but it's been shared around. You'll probably be able to find it pretty easily, but it actually looks at a bunch of different x-rays of hip and of pelvises and femurs, and there's different angles for everybody. There's a little bit of variation. So if we told everybody to squat with their feet pointed straight forward, we'd have a lot of hip issues. We'd have a lot of lower back issues. And there's basic rules like sitting back in your hips, letting the knees bend but you know using your whole body to get through it but your stance and setup is going to be different depending on your anatomy right so yeah take, same as all these climbing moves yeah. you're you're built different you're going to do it a little different yeah taking yeah. basic concepts and then bending those concepts or morphing those concepts in a little bit to fit you and your goals yep <clears throat> i think that carries us right into our number four and that's that the myth is that there's a best way to strength train. Yep. And this goes beyond just form and technique. We're talking about kind of the whole, the whole enchilada here. Like whether it's, um, some people prefer and preach barbells only, you know, or bilateral only. Some people love kettlebells some people love body weight. Some people love unilateral. Some people are all about five by five, everything, you know? Some people say you shouldn't even be training the, or you should like your strength training should just be, it should only move your rock climbing further. Like right. it needs to be as specific as humanly possible right. to climbing. If you're not doing just loaded pull-ups on edges and heavy, heavy hangs, what are you doing? Everything else is a waste of time. Right. Yeah. And that there is a best way to strength train, I think is a myth. Yeah. There's no yeah. best way, you know, again, like you said, this is piggybacking off of what we just said, but people have different anatomies. They have different goals. Um, people have different fiber types. You know, some people have more fast twitch. Some people have more slow twitch, you know, obviously if someone who has a predominance of slow twitch fibers, does a lot of slow, high rep lifting, they're really not trying to change a whole lot, especially if they're trying to be a powerful, snappy rock climber. They're going to continue to be more slower, you know, crawl up the rock face, which, you know, isn't a bad thing. It just depends on your goals. But, you know, and also depending on unilateral, bilateral, I think a mix is pretty helpful, especially yeah. as a climber. <clears throat> like, yes, we do a lot of unilateral stuff on the wall. We also do a lot of bilateral stuff. We place both feet. We drive with both feet. Sometimes we pull with one foot. Um, sometimes we pull with both arms. Sometimes we pull with one one arm. It just really depends on where you feel you're weak at that point in time. And who's to say two months down the road you need to work on something a little bit different. Right. Depends on your mobility characteristics. You know, a lot of people who have had a previous shoulder injury, I think there's someone here who had a pretty catastrophic shoulder injury. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Wasn't catastrophic. It was yeah. fine. 
Yeah. I just went straight into overhead military press immediately after. Yep. And, you know, there's some difference in mobility there. And I think gluing both arms to one implement, something's got to give somewhere. And, you know, if you are only, if unilateral strength training is perceived as the only way to go about it, there's going to be some problems down the road. Um, Likewise, if your issue is generating as much force as possible throughout your whole body and you're only lifting one implement in one arm, there can be some problems down the road there too. So it's really important to look at what you're trying to do with your strength training and how is that going to support your climbing. Um, And, you know, that's going to require different implements, methods, and tools for different people. So if someone's telling you there's only one way to do it and you only need one implement, again, use caution. Yeah, and, you know, having worked with a wide variety of clients, I would bring in the idea that just because someone doesn't have something available to them, um, equipment or facilities or whatever, as a coach, I'm not going to say, well, you don't have the best way available, so you just shouldn't even do it. You know, that would be silly. There are all sorts of ways to accomplish a lot of these goals. Almost none of the strength training goals that we have are like there's one path to it. There's almost always a bunch of different ways to get there. Yeah. You know, I think one one thing to take into consideration when we talk about uh like evidence based coaching, one of a lot of people say that there are four tenets to it, and one of them is the client's preferences. Because the thing is, it doesn't matter what you think is best if the client's like, "Look, bro, I can do body weight." You like, don't throw research studies at your clients. Give them required reading. Yeah, exactly. But have you have you read the research, the literature? I'm gonna need some citations. Um, but the thing is, if someone's like, "Hey, I've got some gymnastics rings and I can do body weight stuff," that's literally all I have access to. That's what you've got to work with. Um, so I think it's real. You know, it is very important to look at personal preferences. Um, and something else that I think is very important to talk about on this is. I've been, so I've been climbing, I think, 14 years now. Chris, how how long have you been climbing? Approximately 75 years. Okay, yeah. Um, (laughs) Paul? 12, 11. Okay. I think 25, actually. Okay, so collectively, that's a lot. Like, I don't know, we've got like 50 plus years between the three of us. I think like 100 plus. Yeah. (laughs) But at least a decade of mine was trad climbing, so that doesn't really count. Ooh. (laughs) Edit that part out. Um, So something that's kind of neat about the longer you've been climbing is you get to see cycles. Um, when you first start climbing, you've been climbing for a few years. It's kind of easy to think that, you know, everything and to say, Oh, like, you know, this is how this works. Um, a common instance is you go into the gym, you climb and there's this guy who climbs, you know, the super strong guy in the gym who climbs V 11. And you're like, well, he just comes in, climbs like, campus boards does heavy pull-ups and that's all he does he doesn't do any strength training anything like that and the thing is having climbed you know like 14 years now i've seen a lot of these people go through this full cycle of they they just want to do anything to make themselves climb harder and then they hit a fucking brick wall really hard and they get hurt and it takes them a long time to get out of it if they ever do get out of it and it's cyclical. Like then you see the next person who's, oh man, this guy, he's like, he's a, uh, he's the next prodigious kid. Like he's going to be an absolute crusher crushes for a little while, either comes into an injury or something like that. And it just keeps happening. Like, but people who are robust and who are able to make themselves climb for a long time because they've built up this necessary strength. Like they're the ones who over time are able to climb really well. Like, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at climbing, and this is something I wish I would have known when I was younger, I would be much more concerned with acceleration over velocity. So just because I am able to jump up to a really fast, like, speed or say, like, oh, I can get to this, like, climbing level, like, that's cool. But if it's at the cost of health, which is something, like, 
it's something that I did. You know, I pushed things very hard to the point to where I had elbow injuries, severe shoulder issues, a lot of finger is- issues that took me years of stepping back away from to be able to start building up again. You know, if I could have just said, hey, I'm going to be smart about this. I'm going to build a well-rounded base. These things may not make me climb harder tomorrow. They may not make me even climb harder next year, but they're going to be the things that allow me to keep pushing myself as hard as I want five years from now, 10 years from now. If I could have done that, like, man, that would have been amazing. Like if I could pass one piece of information to myself when I was younger, that would be it. It's like really look at the long run. Because it's so so easy when you've been climbing two years to just say, oh, I'm man, I'm just going to keep pushing harder and harder. Like that's what all the guys around me I see are doing. You um, wouldn't have passed yourself information about your La Sportiva pajamas. Uh, they're pretty amazing. And I've got the matching top on now too. I switched <laughs> between our last two podcasts. No, I think what I hear you saying is that there actually is a best way to strength train. And that's slow and steady and consistently but not being this like bright burning comet who's just going to die out. Yeah. Like I think you can get a, and here's the issue. You can, you can hang board hard and campus board hard. If you had told me when I had started climbing, like if you told a 18 month into climbing Nathan, Hey, I want you to campus board five hours a day, seven days a week, and it will make you an amazing rock climber. I've been like, cool. Yeah. I'll just stop sleeping. That's fine. I will make the time. It would not have been an issue. Like I wouldn't have even questioned it, but I mean, and that's just it. It's like early climbers are so psyched and it's so easy to fall into that trap. And, uh, yeah, I wish I could have just told myself, Hey, like if you can actually take the long run approach of this, like you you will continue getting better mm-hmm. you won't hit you won't hit all these like hard stops i have a friend who i was just talking with who he climbed v9 in two years and this was quite a while ago and he had read uh an eric hurst book that said once you climb v9 you're elite and you can campus board he was like fuck yeah time to campus board blew himself up because he had been climbing two years and uh it took him another, I think, seven years to be able to get back to where he was. Right. Because it just took him so long because he, you know, blew up, kept trying to push hard. Another thing went wrong. And that just kept yep. happening. And this is something that it's so easy when you first start. And when you're only a few years into climbing, the human body's really resilient. Like, it can handle a lot of fucked up stress for a, for kind of a while, until it doesn't. And then you don't want to be on the end of it when that does, when that happens, when your body's just like, Hey dude, we've been trying to work around this, but you're moving like an asshole and you're just like treating me like shit. Like this is where we're at now. And you don't want to get to that. I always think it's a good analogy. Um, a lot of that high intensity training stuff tends to, you know, you've got a cup, and you know all the fluid in the cup is your training capacity all that high intensity stuff takes stuff out of it and then it gets refilled a little bit higher but you know your movement quality work your basic strength work your technique work that makes that actual cup a lot bigger and a lot of times people tend to just focus on putting stuff into the cup and at the same time taking a lot out of it and not doing the boring stuff that helps make that cup bigger Mm -hmm. and you know that's really going to be the key to the longevity of a lot of it. Yeah. Well, I think now that Nate's brought the mood down talking about people crashing and burning and failing to ever see their potential and falling apart, maybe we should just take a break. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> break. Break. What's up, everybody? Chris here. I'll keep this short and sweet. I just wanted to let you guys know about our new updated proven plans that are now available on the website. These are the patterns that we've seen emerge after years and years of training hundreds of climbers. The patterns that at a specific level help those climbers reach the next level. And this includes our two newest proven plans, 
Just Climb More Boulders and Just Climb More Routes, written specifically for the new or novice climber. Why Just Climb More? Because frankly, we feel like the advice that most new climbers get, Just Climb More, is a lazy cop-out answer. While you will be climbing more, you won't just be climbing more. Instead, you'll be climbing more focused, more intentional, and you'll be learning a more efficient way to progress. We've updated those with weekly progressions, all of the most recent ideas and concepts that have been proven to work in training for climbing, as well as new videos for every exercise and every drill that you'll do. This is all laid out for you week to week, delivered in our mobile app. And you can choose to work with a coach. We've just hired a new coach to work specifically with everybody in these proven plans. And you can also join a group chat that's filled with other people also doing proven plans at the same time as you. Honestly, I don't think there's a better value in training for climbing. And you can check these out at powercompanyclimbing.com. Click on the train with us tab. All right, back to the show. Right, right we are back. Um, we are to our number three in our top six training myths. And all of these are things that we see pretty commonly. Obviously, there are top six. Um, but I do see this one really often that people think their training needs to be really highly structured. Um, frankly, most of us just can't do that. Like we don't have the capacity to have these super structures and these complicated things in our lives. If you do, and that's good for you and that works for you, great. But I think it's a myth that for your training to be effective, it has to be really highly structured. Yeah. A lot of times people see complicated as guaranteed success because it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and you know, we tend to forget that life tends to be complicated too. And most of us who are climbers have other stuff going on too. Um, we're not all paid to rock climb. We have jobs, we have families, we have kids, we have other responsibilities and trying to plug in a super complicated training plan is going to lead to things getting off the rails and more often than not, we're not going to see the gains, hashtag gains, um, that were promised with, with a Z. Oh yeah. A couple Z's Yeah, that were promised, um, you know, by sacrificing 72 hours and two days for climbing. Are there 72 hours and two days? Some of these plans think they are. <laughs> <laughs> What's bad is I didn't even pick up on that. <laughs> I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> Shit, there's not. <laughs> I was trying to do the math for a week, but I gave up and just picked a couple days. <laughs> Numbers yeah. are hard. Yep. I've seen a lot of people start these really highly structured plans and get, you know, a month, maybe even two months in. Who's making it a month? <laughs> <laughs> I got so many blank I'm just, journals. I'm just throwing out numbers here. <laughs> but then just crash and burn. Then yeah. they're off the plan. Mm-hmm. And they can't ever say whether it was helpful or not because they never finished the plan. They have no idea. Mm-hmm. And that takes up season after season after season for a lot yeah. of people. And people think, I'm off the plan. I just, I missed my workout. It's done now. It's over. And then it just all stops oh, because man. it's yeah. if it's not structured, it's not right. Mm-hmm. And I think it's pretty, it'd be interesting to see this because, you know, we all have a good amount of autonomy in how we build our training plans for the folks we work with. Mm-hmm. Do you have unstructured climbing days or training days in your in most of your clients' plans? Yeah, totally. Yep. Do you, Nate? Sometimes, yeah. Or yeah. at least some like freestyle areas within their Exactly. More structured plans. Yeah. And it's important to have a couple of those days in there because, you know, sometimes structured stuff doesn't fit. And instead of saying something that's structured needs to happen and we need to force it to happen, we're better off just getting in and having Mm -hmm. an unstructured day compared to, you know, not going in at all because what we have planned isn't going to work. Yeah. And I will say this, you know, just in contrast to that, I do have clients who whose lives are very unstructured Mm -hmm. and 
and sort of chaotic and it's really helpful for them to have a structure when they go into the gym. Sure. So sometimes it is helpful to have that structure, but mm-hmm. I think the myth is that you're not going to get at anything out of it unless it is really highly structured. And Everything that's just has not the to case. have a rep and set scheme and things like that. Right. And I think something that's important about that is just because let's say you have a rep and set scheme for everything you do and it can all fit in an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't mean it's actually ideal. It just means yeah. that it's measurable in one specific way. Well, I think we've, I mean, I think we can prove that very easily because there are 400 different hangboard protocols, you know, Actually, that are there's 401. There's probably 400,000, <laughs> but which um, one is the best? But Exactly. Only one of those can be the best. What if did Ava say? Best. We're going to save that for the Ava podcast. Um, I can't tell the people, not just yet. <laughs> they can't know the truth. They're not ready for the truth, Nate. <laughs> but no one would be doing all those others if there was a best, Mm -hmm. but all of these things are so there are people out there for every one of these hangboard protocols who tracks it religiously and has these complex programs to, to tell them what they're getting out of it. And I mean, 399 of them aren't the best way. So why are you tracking it this way? Why are you paying that much attention to it? Why all the structure? So I think we can prove that just because it's complex doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. So who do you feel like would be best served by having slightly less structured training? Um, Frankly, I think people who think they have to be structured not that they need it for some reason but if they feel like they have to be structured i think those people should have some sort of freestyle time some sort of don't keep track of your hangs go hang for a few seconds don't use a stopwatch don't use a timer don't count the reps let's just go hang for these 15 minutes don't even measure how deep that hold is you don't measure how deep don't choose an rpe for your hang you know just go do these things find a small hold what's the smallest hold you can hang on today hang on it three times throughout your session you know if you're super into measuring all your hang boarding i think just letting go of that being able to let go of that is really important so people who latch onto it and that's what drives their training drives their climbing could really benefit from getting outside of their own heads a little bit. That's mm-hmm. one person. Any others that jump out at you? Um, right away, the people who can benefit from less structure. Yes. I think people who travel a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I have several clients who are traveling a ton. If we can come up with really effective strategies that aren't super structured, it's really nice for them because they're in different gyms all the time. They're in hotels with different equipment. Um, so tons of structure just stresses them out. Like I can't get my workout in because I don't have this available or totally. this available. It's not the same hang board as the other gym. This gym didn't have kettlebells. That one did, you know, so a little less structure for them is really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Do you have any concepts mm-hmm. or kind of underlying strategies you use for those people to kind of design sessions for them or you just give them themes or actually i i mean i do use some of the ideas that we talked about in our episode on time efficient training strategies um, such as if they're traveling to different climbing gyms all the time we'll use you know go into the gym and you're just going to spend the first half of your session finding eight boulders that feel, you know, that are about 50% of your max. And we're going to try to do those eight boulders on the minute for four rounds, you know, so that you'll spend 
30 minutes finding those eight boulders and then the next rest of your session will be just sort of a density on the minute boulders and they can do that in any gym and it doesn't have to be the same boulders week after week after week um (coughs) it's just a good exercise for them if they need a little structure but it can be a little freestyle as well there are also lots of sessions where especially if it's a strength session where i'll have people just go in and work on their turkish get-ups you know if if they have access to kettlebells but going in to do a full workout just doesn't work out for whatever reason because they're on the road they can just slip little things in we'll just go focus on the you know the ascent of a turkish get up and that's it you know so i do choose little themes and play around with little things to help people make the most out of those sessions and then we have some exercises in the app that we like like single session sends you know that's just a that's a wide open thing go choose some boulder problems that you think you can send in this single session and work on those cool you know and that helps teach tactics um it kind of forces you to rest and be more tactical not just about how you approach the boulder problem but how you approach the whole session Um, And that carries over to your rock climbing, period. Um, So I think there are lots of ways to make these less structured sessions work for people. Cool. So let's say you got someone who's just uh, sloppy with everything they do, and they need a little more structure. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there are this everything lies on a spectrum. So while I think there are a lot of people who, such as beginners, who I don't, th- I think they're going to benefit more from having a slightly less structured mm-hmm. system yep. than more structured. Um, there are some people who, uh, you know, maybe if they had a little bit of a game plan, they'd uh, kind of get a little further. Mm-hmm. Are there any specific examples that you can think of? of people who, or types of people who would really benefit from adding just a touch more structure. I mean, I think you just, you just said beginners. And I, I do think that all of us are guilty of using the just go climb more, um, answer for how to get better as a beginner. Totally. Um, but lots of people are really hungry for, but, climb how like there's so many ways to climb now do i go in and boulder do i go in and climb roots do i get on the auto belays you know what do i do and if you don't tell them they're just going to do what google tells them yeah they're going to get on there and find something from somebody and because our seo isn't the best they're not hitting (laughs) us first (laughs) exactly so hangboard and overhead press oh yeah yes yeah totally together and hangboarding that's what they're going to come across um So I think those people can use a little more structure. Um, I think people who've been freestyling forever Mm -hmm. can use a little more structure. And it might be nice for them to have that change. That it's going to be adaptations they haven't been asked to make before, you know, so could be really helpful for them. What about you? Um, I'm going to hit you up one more follow up. Damn, Um, I'm answering all the questions. I'm the host of this motherfucker. Why am I answering all the questions? Go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> hey everybody this is your host Nate Rolle. Um so let's say you have people that would benefit from a little bit more structure they're uh they've got kind of a laissez-faire approach to rock climbing and training is there a good first step that either of y'all can think of to just adding a little bit more structure to their training process journals I don't, I don't know what you mean by process journal. Is that something we sell? I don't. <laughs> Actually, that's not where I would start, frankly. I would, I would start by taking the things that they already do and, and calling them structured already. You know, like a lot of people will go in and boulder, and they'll boulder in a specific zone. 
some people are really good at just falling into that limit bouldering zone. Some people are really good at only being in the middle zone, you mm-hmm. know, where they're basically doing power endurance. And I would, I would start by showing them this is the zone you're in and this is what that is. Here's a session that does that. Here's a session that does this. Let's break those up and let you see that there are these different things. So give them that sort of structure. I like that. Um, And I think that will help them understand that my laissez-faire attitude toward climbing results in doing the same thing over and over and over. Even Mm -hmm. if I think it's something different, I fall right back into that same mode all the time and might help them break out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Totally. Why, why do you like the process journal as a, an intro to structure? Uh, I think, so I think as far as building structure goes, I think there are two ways to approach it that work really well. Um, one is front loading it. So one of my favorite things is just buy a pack of sticky notes. And I used to do this. I, uh, just kept preferred color, classic yellow. No, I never had yellow. I always had a mix, mix patch. So my dad's a home inspector and he always kept uh, note cards or sticky notes up in um, the like sun visor of his van, which yep. I now own. And <laughs> so they're uh, like neon green, pink, blue, and I think it's just those three colors. Um, so I would pull one of those down. I'd pull up into the gym parking lot. I already knew roughly what I wanted to do, but I would write down on a sticky note every night before I'd go into the gym exactly what I was going to do. So 15 minutes of one touch warm up, 30 minutes of perfect repeats, whatever, go through the whole thing. If I was going to do hangboard workout, I would write out roughly what it would be. And I, you know, I was like, well, if, whatever I'm doing, it will fit on the sticky. If I'm, if I can't fit on a sticky note, I'm doing too much. Um, and I would just take that. I would tuck it into the pocket of my bouldering, uh, bouldering bag. And I would just reference it. I would start a timer on my phone, reference the sticky note, and the second I'd hit, you know, 30 minutes, like, okay, I switch. Yep. Um, so I think front-loading it and looking at, okay, go in with a plan so that you know what you're doing. Um, but I think also what's really important is recording what you're doing. Um, so I think you can do it either way, but if you have something that you're doing consistently, writing it down and just so that you can look a month later and say, oh, this is what I did for the last month. You know, I went in and moonboarded for an hour three times a week. And I wonder why I don't have any power endurance. It's because I haven't done more than five moves. Right. You know, um, I think knowing, having both having a plan and knowing what you've been doing are both really important. And I think that's a really important part of, important part of that sort of structure that a lot of people miss. A lot of people record what they've done, but they never go back and look at it. Um, so I think that has to be in place. Um, that's probably my only, and I'm not, I don't have a beef with our process journal, but I do think that's the one thing that's missing is that we're not like tucked into the pages so that when they get to the end of it, we're like, Hey, go back and look, look through this thing, you know, do it right now. Mm-hmm. It does say to do that in there. Yeah. But by the time people get to the end, they've forgotten what they read in the instructions. So maybe we need to put some pages I've actually just yeah just tucked in the middle of it that just say go back and review the last month. Yeah. So every the one I'm <clears throat> yeah couple weeks or yeah. something like that. Yeah, the one I've got right now, it's every 10 days I have a star in the top corner of it mm-hmm. of the page and so I'm like okay, go back, look at the last 10 day 10 climbing days. What have you what do you see? Are there any patterns um which typically there are. Yeah. Um and you know what what can we learn from that? Yep. Have you seen any, either of you, seen any big problems with having highly structured training other than what we've already talked about? I mean, it's, I mean, especially you, you're in a world, Paul, where a lot of people are very, very analytical and numbers-based and have been for a long time. It's still a somewhat new thing for climbers. Outside of what we've talked about, no. I do think it takes reinstating that 
being highly structured when you have a highly structured job and highly structured outside of climbing life, you know, sometimes climbing is going to have to make some sacrifices to make that happen. But I, mean, I think all we have to do really is look at most of the best climbers in the world right now. And they didn't get there by being super highly structured. Right. Most of them. If I could see Adam Andre's Excel spreadsheet from since he from the time he was eight years old until now, that'd be great. <laughs> right. And you know, that's not saying that it's bad to be highly structured. It's just saying that it's not a way that you have to be. Yeah. Right. Doesn't mean you're slacking if your training plan isn't super complex and structured. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. Certain times I don't think it's completely necessary. Some people also do thrive off it though. Like if that's what gets you psyched and you you know, you write a training plan and you stick to it. Fantastic. Yeah. Good I had a you. consultation were, with a woman. I remember this. Yeah. We, we were in, uh, where were we? Oh God. Oh, we were in Knoxville. Yes. That's we right. were at that little coffee shop and I had a consultation with this woman whose training program was very, very complicated and very and, long and very long. And that was the first thing she said to me was, you're going to tell me it's too complicated, it's too long, I will stick to this. I'm good at it. I, I can totally do everything on here. I've done it in the past. I was like, okay, we won't even talk about that then. Yeah. Like, if you know this is how you operate, great, do it. Yeah. Um, Any more either one of you want to say on that topic before we move on? <clears throat> I think I'm good to move on over here. Yeah. All right. This next one is yours, Nate. And um, I think it's an interesting idea. I think we could do a whole podcast, separate podcast on this, but it's that you can't really piece together a good climber. You know, this myth that there's no assembly required. Like you can, you can take little pieces, train ends of the spectrum and somehow it's all just going to gel together automatically. That's not a real thing. Yeah. You know, you can look at someone like Alex Magos and say, oh, he's got really strong hands. He's got strong shoulders, uh, strong core. And uh, there you go. You know, he's got some decent endurance. So that makes a 15C rock climber. He's got rosy cheeks. <laughs> Very rosy cheeks. <laughs> um but the thing is, you know, it's funny, actually. Uh, I remember one of the first times he posted a video of him doing his one-arm hangs, his one-arm dead hangs. And he did it with, I think, it was with half body weight, which he's a little human. But uh, it was something like 28 kilos. Mm -hmm. And he was holding, I think it was like a shopping bag with weights. <laughs> right, right. With like a 20-kilo kettlebell. And he was doing a one-arm hang on a one-pad edge. And I remember seeing that, and I was just like, that's unbelievable if i could do that there's not a rock climb i've tried in my life that i wouldn't just do tomorrow um and so he posted that and i think it was maybe a day later he posted a video of him doing something like 14 one-arm pull-ups and i was like yeah this is it like you you know it's so easy to look at that and be like duh this is why he's great and what's funny is on instagram i came across a video of a guy from South America who he was like, Hey, he was like a buddy of mine put me up to putting this on Instagram. And it was him doing at more or less the same body weight, the exact same one arm hang that Magos did and even more one arm pull-ups. And I was like, who the fuck is this person? And I like scrolled through his uh, Instagram sending like V 11s, V 12s, not V 16s, not like 15 C. Right. right. Like this is someone who is pound for pound one of the strongest climbers in the world who none of us have heard about, or I'm sure plenty of people, some people have heard about, but it's like he is not a world-class athlete. He is not a right. world-class climber. And it's hard, to, it's hard to keep in mind that when Magos goes somewhere and does something, like when he went to the new, he did like 25 or 35 14s in two weeks without a rest day. Right. His rest day was he drove to the Red River Gorge, did two 14Ds, and drove back. I don't know. 
I don't actually know how that was a rest day, but he somehow he classified <laughs> it. He was just like, yeah, I took a rest day. I went down and I did the two hardest things in the red and I came back. I, my rest days aren't that productive. <laughs> but the thing is, it's very easy to look at these people, these great climbers and say, oh, you know, this person has this. That's necessary. That's this, what I need. That, that's what I need. Like, I need this. I need that. Um, though I will say one of my absolute favorite quotes ever, keeping on the Magos uh, tip, is uh, someone in an interview asked Magos what he needed, or if he could have any skill, what would it be? And he said, I would like to have Jan Ho your sloper strength, because then I would be the ultimate climber. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, there you go. Just that's it. Just that one. He would also be the ultimate German climber, which I thought was a nice. That's true. Addition that's, to yeah, it. Yeah, really but, good point. <clears throat> you know what else is funny is that we often say, "If I could have," oh yeah, Daniel Woods's lock off strength and Jimmy Webb's ability to jump, and you know Dave Graham's creative beta, Nathaniel Coleman's <laughs> chin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i say that all the time yeah um but the fact is none of those people have those other things like daniel doesn't have jimmy's jumping ability mm. uh, jimmy doesn't have daniel's crazy lock off anything to your waist ability they don't have dave's creative beta and none of them have nathaniel's chin no but somehow they've all become world-class athletes without having those things um so i think that you know that sort of just <laughs> highlights the fact that all these things that we want that think are we're going are going to make us the complete climber it's just not true there's some sort of something in there that we're not seeing some intangible unmeasurable thing i think they all have you know above a certain minimum percentage of all that but it takes a unique thing to put it all together. Yeah. You know. Yep. Being able to synthesize all those things and all those movement qualities and all just the simple strength in certain patterns to bring it all together. What is that thing? Because I need it. Yeah. <laughs> Process journal. We talked about this before, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's what it is. <laughs> that's exactly what yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? And like, that's kind of the issue is. It's 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 still out there. Yeah, and, and I, I think it goes all... for training as well. You know, I'm, I alluded to this a little bit, but there's this really popular idea in training right now that we should only be training at the top and at the bottom, so to speak. So really low-end climbing and really high-end climbing low intensity, high intensity. And I've done this sort of method and I like this method quite a bit, but I spent a fair amount of time leading up to that learning to climb in the middle zone, getting really comfortable in the middle zone and being able to take that really low end and that high end and gel them together. And if you've never been there, if you've never climbed in that middle zone and gotten pumped out of your mind, but continued climbing and holding it together then the first time that happens you're going to fucking fall apart no matter how good your high and low ends are so i think that i mean i think it's being missed all the way around that you can't just get the parts and then assemble a good climber yeah yeah any more you guys want to say about this one no, I think this kind of segues us really well into yeah. our uh, final topic. Which is? Um, you already wrote the name, so uh, <laughs> someone else say it. <laughs> that the answers are clear. Yeah. And that's the it's myth. A, it's myth. a myth. The answers are not <clears throat> clear. Yeah. it's Especially in today's age where a lot more money effort time is being put into trying to understand climbing training and there's all this data data via via whatever <laughs> coming out and being looked at people see these numbers and they think oh that's it that's a fact and 
that must mean we have this answer. This is exactly what I need to do to get more strength, to get more power, to get more power endurance, to climb X grade. And it's not that simple. I mean, the, the data just doesn't show us that yet. May never. Um, mm-hmm. And we don't have all of these answers. We have some basic ideas, some basic principles, but the how we get there is a little less clear. Yep. Yeah. We're in the infancy, like, you know, certain directions are starting to pop up, but, you know, who's to say five years from now we'll look back and be like, oh, yep, you know, all we thought was the way to go is wrong. Because that's a very likely possibility. It's happened over and over. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, that's, <clears throat> there are two things to look at here. One is that so much of information comes out on social media nowadays. And with social media, gray zone is not taken too kindly. You need to have a hard stance on whatever you say. Right. So it's mm-hmm. either, hey, this is the this is the truth. This is it. Everything else is wrong. Like, I have the motherfucking answer. Yep. Absolutes and blanket statements make good posts. Exactly. Like, no one wants to hear, hey, guys, uh, you know, this is something that we think works. Uh, we're not entirely certain. Uh, we kind of believe it. Like, it might not be true for everyone. There's a lot of gray zone here. Uh, I've seen it work for a lot of people, but I've also seen it not work. Exactly. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. They want to They want to hear, hey, this is the perfect solution. We have the answer, the magic bullet. Like, drink the snake oil. Mm-hmm. Do you drink snake oil? I don't actually know what you do with snake oil. I don't oil. know what you do either, but I'm going to start selling it. Power Company Snake Oil. Power Company Snake Oil. We snake oil a, sounds disgusting. We need a hoodie that says Power Company Snake Oil. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that is like that is one huge thing of... Um, having the answers is that on social media, there is no room for gray zone. Um, And, you know, I'm just going to say that if you have a coach or you want to work with a trainer and they just say, oh, I have the answers, I can tell you exactly what's going on and I can fix you, period, make it better, I can get you there, no questions, I would beware because it's going to take a lot more than just a workout that's put down on paper. You should be looking for someone who wants to create an open dialogue and wants to work with you and not just tell you what to do. Yeah. Yeah. None of us, none of us, not just us, but no one, not, not Steve Bechtel, not Lattice, not Natasha Barnes, not, what about Ava? Not Ava. She's my favorite. We're going to, the Ava podcast will come out one of these days. You just wait. Yeah, I'm waiting. We're talking. She's writing something for the blog. Nice. Um, and none of us have the answers. We have ideas. We have successes. And we all have failures, too. So these answers just aren't as clear as everyone would like to believe that they are. Yeah. You know, and I think something that's really important to understand is that <clears throat> data and science is... These things are our best explanation of what's going on as far as what we know right now. We say, hey, this is the information that we know currently, and this is what we can explain. But in 10 years, we will know more information. Like, we will have different explanations. You know, things that we would consider a fact 10 years ago may not be a fact right now. A lot of things change. And that's like the beauty of science is that it is... It isn't this strict, rigid thing that, hey, this has to be this way. It's it's very curious thing. It's, you know, we're trying to find be- the best information. We're trying to make the most educated guess we can. And so to say, hey, I have the number one best method possible, it's to say that nothing can ever be improved upon. Right. It's, it's really short-sighted. Yeah. Um, Paul? I really don't have anything to add. That's because we have all the answers. We, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. Like, I don't have anything mad. We're we're good. Right. It's getting late here. Yeah. We're gonna head back to the red so we can get up early and go climbing. And um, in the meantime, you guys can find 
Nathan Drolet, the official host of this podcast. Boom. Um, at Crux Padwell on the Instagrams. Mm-hmm. Look for him on there. Go way back to a couple Christmases ago and look at his Amazon Christmas list. Or just type in hashtag 25 days of Amazon Christmas. Yeah. That. You're welcome. Do that. Which one's simpler? <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> a lot of letters. My thumbs are fat. I can't. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, you can find Paul at Crux Conditioning and at cruxconditioning.com. Crux Conditioning on everything but Twitter. Everything but Twitter. You know where to find us. PowerCompanyClimbing.com. At Power Company Climbing on all the things. Paul, are you on Pinterest? You should be on Pinterest. <laughs> I have a Pinterest account, but it's Sanders Sanderson, and I don't think I've used it since the day I created it. <laughs> I get random emails from time to time, and I'm confused. I've blocked all those emails. <laughs> I don't even get those anymore. But we are on the Pinterest in case you need something to pin to your inspiration boards. I don't even know if that's a thing. But pin some of our stuff here on Pinterest. And you can try to retweet us all day. That's what it's called, right? Retweeting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I see that posted on people's Instagrams now and then. You can try to retweet us. You're never going to be able to because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. Maybe don't know. Maybe don't. This time, 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 this